Hi, welcome to your first lecture regarding AP U.S. History. This will cover uh, the first couple of chapters of the book. Uh, this is the pre-Columbian civilizations in America. When we start talking about uh, AP U.S. History, this will cover about 5% of your exam. This will not be, uh, there will not be any essay questions uh, on these uh, topics. However, you could see these in, in the form of a multiple choice and, um, and essay cues. So period one is going to cover anywhere from 1491, which is before the uh, sailing of Columbus over to the West Indies, uh, to the establishment of Jamestown in 1607. Um, so one thing that I want you to think about while we're going through uh, this kind of video lecture, uh, PowerPoint lecture, is to compare and contrast the development of native civilizations based on regional environments. Now, as most of you have been taught throughout uh, your schooling, uh, the uh, native the Native Americans or the American Indians have come across, they, they came from Asia beginning as early as uh, 30,000 years ago over a land bridge that formed the Bering Strait during the Ice Age. The new immigrants were uh, hunters and, and gatherers, and over a period of 15,000 years, various groups spread over the American continents. Uh, by the time of the European discovery in 1491 of the New World, there were perhaps as many as 100 million Native Americans, a vast majority living in Central and South America. Now, for this course, you only have to worry about kind of what's going on in the Americas. And, and one of the important topics uh, involving American history is the story of American civilization and as we begin to push west, if you remember, our 13 colonies are going to get established over here uh, on the East Coast. As we continue to push west throughout the years, uh, throughout the American Revolution, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, Manifest Destiny, we begin to uh, encounter Native Americans, and our history hasn't been hasn't been the best when it comes to how to handle uh, Native Americans. But if you look at this map, you can see that there are uh, four major distinct groupings of uh, Native Americans uh, in in America, and so. Uh, you know, just some things to think about. The development of agriculture is key. By Native Americans, more than 5,000 years ago sparked new cultures and innovations. Hunters who previously roamed the land like nomads established permanent villages. Corn, uh, corn along with sun and water became uh, focal points for many societies and played strong roles in religious ceremonies. In some cultures, the control of corn surplus was directly linked to power and authority. And if you look at the picture here, you can see uh, corn, beans, and squash. And if you put those three things together, they're called the Three Sisters. Now, because America at, at its early stages are uh, vast in farmland, they're going to grow these products and then send them back over to Europe. Uh, Europeans are going to live longer. They're going to live healthier as a result because of these new um, because of these new crops and as they begin to live longer overpopulation is going to become a big problem in Europe and so what happens is you have people that are going to start leaving Europe and moving over not only to North America but Central America and South America as well. Uh, some of the first uh, dentary uh, societies of North America were created by groups known as mound builders um, and we'll look at pictures of that in, a, in here in a minute um, but you know some of the things to think about as tribes begin to uh, lay uh, ground work for their societies. They're, they're going to uh, uh, develop themselves both politically and economically. Uh, they're going to cre create tribal councils. They're going to uh, they're going to believe in communal ownership. Now, this is important as we get into uh, as we get into more history into the 1800s. Is they don't believe in owning land. They believe in sharing the land with each other. And so, in the as early as the 1800s, you'll or late 1800s, you'll see uh, the American government try to split up these lands to. Uh, promote ownership of uh, of these native lands, and uh, as you'll come to find out, they will not get the best pieces of land. Uh, for the U.S. will uh, for the U.S. will will maintain or retain those uh, parts. Uh, language families will develop as a result. Uh, there was, you know, hardly any written language, so a lot of a lot of uh, history of Native Americans is done through research, not necessarily through written language. They have your hieroglyphics and things like that, but most uh, villages are not going to have that. Uh, typically, your family roles tend to be uh, uh, matri uh, mat uh, matrilineal. Um, in, in the aspect where uh, women are going to share in labor except for hunting. Um, and really, depending on where they live, if they live in fertile ground, then obviously they're going to set up and they're going to uh, be more uh, farmers and uh, 
and whereas people that live maybe in the West are going to be more into hunting and gathering. And so the first part, uh, first uh, native lifestyle are the Eastern Woodlands in the Northeast. And this is, this correlates with chapter one of the textbook. Now, this does not take the place of reading the textbook because the, the details of the textbooks are the things that you're going to find on tests uh, and quizzes. But the geography is, is your rolling hills and dense forests. Uh, the Wampanoags and the Iroquois Confederacy make up the main tribes, and as the Puritans uh, come to America, they're going to encounter the Iroquois Confederacy and the Wampanoags. And in the French and Indian War, they'll actually the British will actually form a alliance with the Iroquois Confederacy versus the French and other Indian tribes in uh, Virginia. They'll encounter the uh, Powhatan tribe. Uh, their diet is mainly made of uh, maize, which is corn, beans, and squash. And you can see their culture is made up of hunters and gatherers, warriors. Uh, their the mother is kind of the leader of the of the household. Uh, along with living in longhouses, like you see in the picture here, um, some examples of just living like uh, living in the eastern woodlands are along the Mississippi. Uh, you see different uh, river systems like the Mississippi River. Um, they uh, in the southeast, they also have a diet of, of mice. They use fish, beans, and squash. And here is fertile is fertile ground where they can make uh, uh, pyramid mounds. And so here I'm going to show you some pictures of uh, Cahokia, which is, was one of the big cities in North America, located not too far uh, from uh, St. Louis. Uh, they were known as mound builders. They were believed to be the ancestors of the Creeks, the Choctaws, and uh, Choctaws and the Natchez. Uh, the mound mound building societies formed enormous earthworks into very Various shapes and sizes. Some mounds featured multiple terrace levels on which hundreds and hundreds of houses were built. Uh, the largest known mound had a base that covered nearly 15 acres and rose to the height of 100 feet tall. Uh, while circles, squares, and octagons were the most common mound shapes, some patterns resembled uh, creatures such as hawks, panthers, or snakes. They even believed that different shapes, uh, religious signs, or territorial marks for the first tribes. Uh, the Mississippi culture flourished after the mound builders had expanded their settlements and trading network. Uh, they had also built massive mounds to serve as burial ceremonial sites. As people became more proficient in farming and fishing, they remained longer in one location and developed uh, substantial uh, dwellings. Clusters of mound builders settled in the Ohio Valley along the Mississippi River and as far west as present-day Oklahoma. Um, and so if you ever go visit uh, St. Louis, you can probably visit uh, the Cahokias, and you may come across a relic that looks like that uh, located uh, outside of St. Louis. Uh, along the Great Plains uh, in the Midwest, typically made up of grassland and prairies, uh, the Sioux and the Cheyenne are two tribes that we're going to talk about extensively in this class. Uh, they uh, relied on the buffalo for everything. And so one way that the American government thought that they could uh, get rid of the natives is to exterminate uh, the buffalo. And they used the buffalo for everything. Their fur, obviously, for teepee and clothing. Uh, their stomachs were water bags. Their bones were used for tools. Uh, skulls were used for or uh, bowls, uh, so on and so forth. They typically were nomadic. Uh, their uh, teepees, they were built so that they could be picked up and moved uh, uh, quickly and uh, looking for, obviously, hunters and gatherers if they're looking for uh, food. Uh, in the southwest is where your uh, Pueblos, especially along the Rio Grande Valley, the Pueblo people start, uh, created complex irrigation systems to, uh, to water their cornfields. The Anasazi, or the ancient ones as they were called, in the Navajo language cars that carved out into sandstone cliffs, uh, complete cities with baked uh, mud structures towards uh, towering four to five stories high. They developed now open, uh, open row of terrace uh, gardens that they use for uh, planting uh, crops. Uh, so, um, Irrigation, irrigation systems, and you can see they were built into uh, into uh, uh, plateaus and uh, along cliffs. Uh, a lot of them, uh, obviously, adobe. If you uh, shine uh, the sun into adobe, it gives the appearance of gold, and thereby Coronado's uh, theory of the seven cities of gold uh, was. Uh, was thought to be, but it was just uh, adobe brick homes. Uh, in the uh, Pacific Northwest, along California and even the Great Basin, Basin uh, the geography uh, centered around uh, cedar forests, especially in the upper uh, Northwest. Uh, the Chinook, the Nez Pierce were uh, 
the main tribes that were located there. Uh, a lot of fishing off the Pacific, especially salmon, and in California had access to berries and nuts. Um, and they typically uh, built plank homes. Uh, they were known for their totem poles and their canoes, and they were nomadic hunters and uh, gatherers. All right, and so as we get into uh, European exploration, so you have your natives that are already established there. Uh, they're going to develop sophisticated planting techniques. They're going to allow for them to take full advantage of the land and make the most out of the land and the effort that they put into their agricultural work. Um, they're um, trying to think of something else with the natives. Um, as we get into Europeans, it's important to know the kind of the major uh, the major countries that um, that settled in the in the Americas and how they interacted with the natives, and so we're kind of switching gears uh, from the natives and going into uh, these uh, main, the main countries. Starting so, um, this is recorded in 2019, the summer of 2019, and just recently one of the AP questions was to compare like uh, the Spanish col uh, Spanish colonization versus uh, English colonization. You can definitely certainly see the French, but evaluate the important causes of European uh, exploration. Why are they coming over and the colonization of the Americas and having the ability to compare and contrast the developments of the lifestyle of the Spanish, the French, and the English colonies in North America. And I think that's kind of one of our first big task is to make sure that we can that we can compare and contrast uh, these three uh, groups. So let's start with uh, Europe uh, before exploration. A lot of this is, is world history review for a lot of y'all, but the Renaissance is going to is going to introduce a, a bunch of uh, technological innovations. So for example, like the the caravel, which was a new vessel that could sail against the wind, uh, the invention of triangular sails. So it makes it a lot easier to sail uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. The Astrolab is a uh, a navigation tool tool that was discovered by the Muslims and the Chinese uses uh, uses the compass. So I'm going to go back to the previous slide. And so uh, in Europe, you see the growth of England and France and Spain, and don't forget the impact of of these uh, of food being able to get back to uh, to Europe, and so people are living longer. Uh, Protestant religions are going to start being formed: uh, Lutheranism, Calvinism, uh, the Church of England, or uh, the one that King uh, Henry VIII is going to create that's going to force the Puritans and the Pilgrims out of uh, Great Britain. And then, of course, the Catholic uh, Counter-Reformation. Um, I already talked about that. All right, so here's some pictures of the, the cell and the astrolabe and the, and the compass. Um, and so when it comes to English colonization, uh, Christopher Columbus gets credit for, uh, obviously, Spain um, uh providing the money for, for Christopher Columbus uh, to sell the ocean blue in 1492 and la land in the West Indies. And his interaction with the natives is one of those that, that's come up with controversy over recent years as historians have accused him of uh, genocide, uh, whereas maybe us as uh, elementary students have uh, learned to celebrate his uh, uh, the things that he did uh, as an explorer. Uh, but, you know, depending on which historian you, you listen to, and I know in my face-to-face -face classes, we do a lot of stuff dealing with uh, Howard Zinn, who's a liberal historian, that will take the side of the victims and say the genocide was apparent, whereas uh, uh, Allen and Schweikert, uh, uh, conservative historians tend to believe that the numbers are embellished and that he's really a, a hero and kind of guilty of, uh, of circumstance. And so the question you got to ask yourself is, are we, is it fair for us to judge uh, Christopher Columbus or other historical figures by today's standards in, in current day uh, 2019? Uh, for France, uh, Jacques Cartier in 1534 is going to sail down the uh, St. Lawrence River and they're going to settle in the Ohio River Valley. Uh, the Dutch under Henry Hudson is going to land in uh, New Netherlands, which we call uh, New York City today. The capital was New Amsterdam, which we know today as New York City. Uh, and then in England, you've got uh, our 13 colonies, whether they're charter colonies, proprietary colonies, or uh, royal colonies. So just some things about more things about Christopher Columbus, some myth and reality. Um, he proceeded, persuade Isabella to finance the Western expedition to 
uh, Cathay, which is uh, in uh, India, and uh, there are rumors that up until his final breath that he believed that he landed in India, not necessarily the West Indies. So if you think about West Indies, uh, Indy being West uh, India, uh, in 1492 was his initial voyage to the West Indies, and this PowerPoint will be it'll be in Canvas for you if you want to click on these different things that'll take you to, you know, if I click on this right here, uh, it'll take you trying to think where it will take you. Uh, it may not pop up. Uh, anyway, it'll pop up right That's worst time. Um, and then your three uh, uh, sub, uh, uh, sequenced uh, voyages to find uh, the cities of uh, China. And then he's, he's going to call, he's going to be responsible for colonizing the West Indies. And so there'll be a lot of paintings that you'll see of Columbus uh, landing in the West Indies. And uh, a lot of the, <clears throat> a lot of the natives will see him as um, king, not king of God. And so a lot of them are already bound to him even before he lands uh, in, in America. And so here are some pictures of him landing uh, in, in the West Indies in 1492. Um, and then there's some other pictures that are out there that uh, will portray the Indians as uh, bowing down. You can see some are already digging into the dirt and uh, you can see some are kind of hiding uh, there in the uh, distance. All right, some more myths and reality. In 1506, he'll, he'll die uh, clinging to the belief that he had reached the Orient, um, but overall it made Spanish domination in America possible. And so really what we got to do is we got to be able to think, of what, would, what do we think about Columbus as far as was he a historic, was he a heroic figure or was he a murderer? Um, and that's for you uh, to decide. All right. And so here you see kind of the voyages that were made uh, by each of the main three countries. Uh, and the three that I'll talk about are obviously the English, the French, and the uh, Spanish. But you can see even the Port Portuguese are going to land uh, in South America along uh, Brazil and uh, uh, along Brazil. All right. So when it comes to um, the Spanish, um, if you remember when it comes to the Spanish, I don't know if you learned this in world history, but the three G's for gold, for glory, and for God. Um, and so their goal was to spread uh, spread the faith through Christianity, uh, use uh, missionaries to do that, and to convert the natives. Now, not every native, obviously, is going to uh, go for uh, the opportunity for uh, conversion, obviously. Um, but uh, also, they were there for glory, uh, to create nation states within the, uh, within the country, and they'd also be able to use those raw materials and send them back to their mother country. And so here, we introduce the term of mercantilism. You need to know that Mercantilism is where the colonies are going to provide uh, the raw materials to send back to the mother country. The mother country is going to uh, produce and manufacture um, products and then sell back to the colonists. And so the purpose of it is to uh, is to benefit the uh, parent country. And so when this happens with the between the British colonists and the English, uh, they're going to, there's going to be a, um, there's going to be a rebellion that's going to occur as a result uh, of mercantilism. Uh, they also want, uh, obviously, credibility in the world. And then, of course, some are, are going for their personal wealth, like a Coronado uh, or a, a, a Pizarro. Uh, they're mainly looking for gold. And obviously, mercantilism, if they find gold, they're going to send it back to uh, their mother country. Right? And they're doing it for, uh, for gold and for silver, uh, to finance ex expeditions for more colonization, and then obviously to finance a military that's going to come over and, uh, and uh, institute uh, a political system or a nation state uh, in the New World. Uh, here is the Treaty of Torresillas in 1494 that's going to split um, the... Um, uh, is going to split Spain and uh, Portugal's uh, findings. That's one of the reasons why Brazil is mainly uh, Portuguese. All right. And here is a map of the uh, European colonies as they sit um, in. Uh, oh, I'm trying to think what year. Oh, well, this is going to be uh, before the French and any war. So before uh, 1754. Uh, All right. Uh, make sure you know what the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is the uh, is the exchange, obviously, of food plants and disease uh food and plants are going to go go uh to europe uh coming back are going to be obviously disease which is going to decimate the native americans uh you also have uh, animals that are going to come over and so you're here you're going to see the first horses and cattle that are going to come to uh central america and so indians are going to are going to see the benefits of the columbian exchange because they're going to begin using horses for hunting and for uh, for warfare, but they also see the negatives of it because 
because of obviously they have no immunity to disease. Now, for um, for Europeans, they're seeing the benefits because all these uh, products are going back to Europe, and so no different than the Three Sisters, they're going to live longer and healthier lives, and which leads to uh, overpopulation. So, I think one of the things that is important here is to understand kind of the the effects of the uh, of the Columbian Exchange, and so here it is, kind of more a little bit more laid out where the New World. Uh, they have uh, the food. They have the food. They have the metals. And they have the raw materials, and they're going to send back. And then from the old world, from Europe, is you have the produced products, you have livestock, and then obviously smallpox, measles, influenza, uh, so on and so forth. And here are some uh, um, drawings of some of the uh, uh, natives as they were drawn by colonists. Um, you can always pause. I'm not going to necessarily go through any of these, but uh, if you want to know what Christopher Columbus thought in 1493 or the Creek Chief in 1557, uh, what they thought of uh, of kind of the Columbian Exchange, uh, you can certainly pause and take a further look at those things. All right, so when it comes to 1500, nine years after, uh, or I'm sorry, eight years after uh, Columbus uh, sailed the ocean blue, where were uh, people in America in 1500? Well, in Paris, you had the population of only 20,000 living in Paris in 1500. In London, as many as 50,000 people living uh, there in 1500. The British Isles, altogether, 3 million. Uh, in France, 16 million. Uh, however, in, before European contact, North America had as many as 15 million uh, people living, mainly of uh, natives that were living in, uh, in about the same as France, so dispersed throughout North America. Now, remember earlier I talked about hundreds of millions that were probably uh, in South America, where it was a little bit, um, where it was a little bit more warmer climate. They were the most densely settled areas of the world. That's your Aztecs, that's your Mayans, that's your Incas. Um, between 90 to 112 million people in a fifth of the world's population. Population lived in the Americas, and I think a lot of people don't realize how many people natives were living in in, in the New World when uh, Europeans began coming over. All right, so when the Spanish start coming to America, uh, it's it's important to understand kind of the social class structure. So you're looking at the uh, social hierarchy pyramid here here on the right here, and you can see on the very bottom are your enslaved uh, persons that were brought over from Africa and the Caribbean. And we'll get into uh, slavery and how they were brought over from Africa, uh, probably in the next video. And then above that, you have your Native Americans, and then you have uh, your mix. You have a little bit of uh, Spanish and Native American Indian parents. Uh, the Creoles were the ones that were born in New Spain as Spanish parents. And then, of course, the uh, Peninsulares were the Spaniards that were born in actually in uh, Spain. Um, and so the relationship between this, the uh, Spanish and the uh, and the Indians is, is a complex one, mainly because of the Encomienda system. And we're, I'm going to talk about the Encomienda system here, but make sure you understand what the caste system looks like and the, and the social hierarchy uh, uh, looks like there. Um, for the Encomienda system, so the Encomienda system is set up as a relationship between the uh, Spanish and the uh, and the Native Americans. The Native Americans were going to provide the labor for uh, for the Spanish, and in return, they were supposed to get uh, uh, teachings of Christianity and protection. However, when this was put into use, uh, actually, it was the uh, Indians that were being uh, exploited uh, for their labor. Not a lot of cr uh, Christian teachings but it more turned into a, a slave system. And so uh, one of those kind of controversies that occurs uh, in, in, in this relationship was that they were not necessarily being uh, protected nor uh, taught uh, Christianity. Um, it did reward the conquistadors. They were given large land grants, and the inhabitants, like I told you, the Indians were provided labor or, or uh, tribute. Um, they were supposed to protect Indian rights and perform concur, uh, conversions. And uh, remember, in 1650, half a million Spaniards were in the New World. It's by 1650, half a million Spaniards were in the New World. But remember, they're going to be decimated because of uh, disease. Uh, let's see here. Um, Here's some readings about uh, these two guys, Bartolomé de las Casas and Juan Guinness de Sulfa Beta. They both had uh, different uh, opinions about the encomienda system. And as we start getting into things like SAQs and things like that, uh, you know, the encomienda system and the controversy that surrounds it. In this case, uh, obviously, um, you're going to you're going to learn to read, you know, historians and what they thought. Uh, or what their uh, viewpoint was on a topic, and you're going to have to be able to kind of describe what their uh, what their beliefs were. So if you, you take 
take some time to kind of look at uh, Delacasas and his account of the destruction of the of the Indians. That he says they are by nature the most humble, patient, and peaceful, holding no grudges, free from embalments, neither excitable nor quarrelsome. Uh, and so he believes that they are taken advantage of. So Boveda on the right here, he says the Spanish have the perfect right to rule these barbarians of the New World, who in, pr and, in prudence, skills, virtues, and humanity as the inferior to the Spanish as children to adults, and so on and so forth. So you can see that De La Casas believes in treating them with respect, uh, teaching them the Catholic faith, whereas uh, Sepulveda believed that, that uh, they were savages, they were barbarians, they couldn't be converted, and so they had to be used for uh, slave labor. All right. Um, all right. So switching gears and going into the French, uh, the French were um, uh, mostly Catholics, Jesuits. Uh, they were there for fur trade. So if you remember the Spanish, why were they there? Gold, glory, and God. Uh, the French were there strictly for fur trade. Uh, they would, you know, run into the woods. They had a peaceful relationship with the Native Americans. Oftentimes they would intermarry. And so when the French and Indian War happened in 1754, it was the Indians that kind of took the side of the uh, of the natives, or I'm sorry, of the uh, of the French. They created extensive trade networks along the, in the Ohio River Valley and into uh, Canada, and they created alliances with them. Um, so uh, like we talked about before in um, Cartier is the one that's going to uh, sail down the St. Lawrence River. Uh, Samuel Champlain in 1608 is going to establish Quebec one year after uh, Jamestown. And so if you're taking a little French history, you'd probably learn about 1608, just like we, we in eighth grade, you learned about 1607 and Jamestown. Uh, the French Empire included the, the uh, St. Lawrence River, the Great Lakes, the Mississippi River, um, they established New Orleans as a port town later on, uh, which will become obviously an important city to navigate uh, through the uh, Appalachian Mountains. Uh, their missionary activities was to convert the Indians to Christianity was a major uh, colonial motivation. Uh, but the, the French, as compared to the other colonists, didn't really make an effort to truly settle in the Americas. And so when they lose in the French and Indian War, they'll disappear from, uh, from American uh, society, even though they'll come back later uh, when uh, Napoleon uh, takes, uh, takes the throne. Um, they were there mainly for furs and to convert. Uh, the growing trade in, in beaver pelts and fish stimulated the founding of the colony of New France in North America. The fur trade created a partnership between the Indians and the French on uh, trade. Uh, now, for the English, uh, the English are going to come to America uh, de now, depending on which group you are. So, um, here in a minute, I'm going to get to the, uh, well, I won't get to the colonists in this one, but if you are going to Jamestown in 1607, you went there to look for gold. You were a young, single man, and you were going to Jamestown to look for gold. You were part of the Anglican Church. If you were a pilgrim or a Puritan, you were escaping. Uh, religious oppression. You were either going to uh, Plymouth Plantation uh, in uh, in near Massachusetts, or if you're a Puritan, you were going to go establish uh, uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony and establish Boston as a city on a hill in uh, 1620. Uh, the English are going to look at the colonies as an investment opportunity, and so a lot of them will will uh, create joint stock companies where people will invest, and if they hit, you know, if they find. Uh, uh, raw materials, and they're going to be able to bank uh, off of that. Just because that they uh, invested didn't necessarily mean that they went. Uh, the Puritans and Pilgrims typically were families. I wanted to make sure and get. Uh, it's important that you know the difference in the in the Puritans and uh, in Massachusetts Bay Colony and the young single men that went to uh, Jamestown. Um, as population begins to grow, you know, we all like the story of Thanksgiving and Squanto saving, uh, uh, saving the uh, pilgrims. Uh, but then as we have a desire to push uh, west uh, into Connecticut or even in Virginia, a desire to push west or Jamestown, uh, we're going to encounter uh, Native Americans and it's going to lead to war. And so you see uh, a couple slides ago talked about the Spanish and the Pueblo Revolt uh, in, uh, in, in England. In, uh, New England, uh, you're going to see the King, King Phillips War in 1675, which was the bloodiest of, of the Indian Wars, and then, of course, the Pequot Wars in 1636 with, uh, with Connecticut and the Powhatan Wars uh, in, um, in uh, Virginia. All right, so England is going to enter the competition. They're the slowest European power to begin in the New World. They're uh, 
They were achieved preconditions for colonization under Elizabeth the uh, First. The voyages of John Cabot is going to give uh, give them any claims to the area. And changes in the late sixteenth uh, century is going to propel the English overseas. Uh, one is the rising production of wool cloths set by merchants looking for the markets after fifteen fifty, and population growth and rising prices uh, depressed the economic conditions of ordinary people and made them willing to, uh, in- to immigrate into the search of uh, opportunity. Uh, some things and developments when it came to uh, Protestantism. Uh, Martin Luther, in in his ninety nine thesis, is going to play a major role in uh, the creation of Protestant religion in, in England. And so this is going to pit, obviously, the Protestants versus the uh, Catholics. And so some of this should be a, a, a review of what you learned in world history. Martin Luther's attack on the church in the 95 uh, thesis on in 1517. Uh, um, uh, the doctrines of uh, John Calvin and Calvinism, predestination, or where they predetermined who was going to go to heaven. And, and not only that, but try to figure out who were the uh, predestined. So you had Calvinist Christianity that expanded in Northern uh, Europe. You had, uh, led by John Calvin, believed in predestination. Some people were chosen for salvation. In France, you had the Huguenots. In Scotland, you had Presbyterians. Um, and then, obviously, uh, the major uh, denominations that you'll see uh, emerge, especially as you become, as we become a, uh, uh, a Christian nation under the First and the Second Great Awakening later on. Uh, if you came from England, you were a Puritan. You wanted to purify, uh, you wanted to purify the Church of uh, England. Uh, we know that smallpox is gonna is gonna run rampant in um, in in North America. It's gonna decimate the Indian population. So once Indian labor labor is given up as a result of uh, of this, you're gonna see it be replaced by indentured servants. Now indentured servants are uh, people who wanted to come to the Americas but couldn't afford it, and so they're gonna work out kind of a labor contract. And as uh, those indentured servants begin to pay off. Uh, pay off their debt and become uh, their own uh, citizens. Uh, they're going to start learning, turning to uh, slave labor. All right. Um, disease obviously is going to run uh, rampant among the natives, and you can see some examples of how it happened in New England and how it happened in uh, in Plymouth. And then, from a uh, historiography standpoint, as American Indians, New Worlds in the in the Atlantic world, uh, Callaway and Sant. Uh, are two that you'll see sometimes on uh, AP tests uh, and questions on um, on their role in in the colonizing of the Americas, right? And that's going to take us to a colonial development. And so this is where I'm going to uh, stop. So hopefully this was a good review of the first couple chapters. Uh, like I said, make sure that you take time to read the book um, and to get uh, details.